Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Exordium series with Mazel Tov. My name is Amit Chapka the Sun, and I am one of the global advisors here at Mazel Tov, along with being its strategic director. Uh, with us today, we are going. We have Dr. Henry Hillman. Dr. Hillman is a senior lecturer of law at the University of the West of England uh, in Bristol. He's the module leader of commercial law and financial crime and regulations, uh, lecturing on money laundering and cyber-enabled financial crime. His PhD, by the way, Dr. Hindelman is a newly minted doctor, having gained his PhD in 2020. Um, and the PhD was on virtual currencies and the money laundering risks they pose with the focus on the relevant law of the UK and the US and Australia. Um, I also had the pleasure of being one of Dr. Hillman's students back during my days uh, in the, on the LLB. And therefore it gives me nothing but absolute pleasure to invite Dr. Hillman to give us a, an insight into money laundering and everything that has to do with financial crime as a, on a cursory note. Uh, sir, please take it away. Dr. Hillman, you're unmuted now. Yeah. I think I am unmuted. Yeah. Sorry about that. I uh, realized I muted myself earlier out of politeness <laughs> and then uh, couldn't unmute myself. Um, I'm going to disable my video just, just while I'm presenting because it stops. Absolutely. I think it, it might be beneficial for everyone to uh, turn off their videos for the period of the presentation. Yeah. So, fingers crossed, you can now all see my screen. Um, ow, there we go. So I've entitled the presentation Money Laundering, the problem, the solutions and the problem with the solutions. Um, I've only got 20 minutes, so it's going to be quite a um, an overview of the concept of money laundering, of an overview on the solutions and the problems. And we can then uh, delve more into that in the question period. So I suppose the first thing to start with is, as I say, the problem. Um, now, I'm aware we're going to have um, and varied uh, sort of levels of experience with the concept of money laundering in the audience. I thought I'd start with a fairly uh, brief overview. Money laundering is the process or act by which individuals and or groups attempt to disguise, hide or distance um, themselves from illegal activities. Uh, so the aim of money laundering is to be able to enjoy the uh, criminal uh, gains or the, enjoy the gains from your criminal activity. Um, and it's achieved in a variety of ways. So when we look at how money is laundered, um, the most straightforward way is to go to uh, industries or institutions that deal with money. So financial institutions are a good way of laundering your money because they offer services that allow you to transfer money from place to place. Uh, but a whole gamut of, uh, of uh, services, anything that involves money can be used to launder it. So you can use professional bodies such as lawyers, accountants, you're charging but you can obscure the amount of money that you, uh, you pay them. Uh, and they can also help you in your laundering process, cash intensive businesses, property transactions because of the sheer value in property, uh, stock shares, investments, uh, cryptocurrencies, as, as I may uh, touch on later. Uh, anything and cash couriers and money mules are a particular common uh, theme at the moment. So um, just based in the UK, a couple of stories in the press in recent years showing that the use of money mules is on the rise. And the money mule is where you uh, you offer your account to somebody else. So you, you'll transfer money into your account and transfer money out and you may get a slice of that and you'll simply transfer. Yeah, as a result, you're a money mule. I thought it would also be helpful to give a quick overview of how money laundering can get very complicated very quickly. So on the face of it, it seems fairly obvious that we can follow uh, someone's money from where it is now backwards. Uh, we have a lot of information about um, transactions that histories are kept so we can see where your money came from. Uh, and where it's where it's been basically. So a very simple money laundering process could be splitting up your dirty money as it gets called into uh, sort of maybe a current account and then doing a charity transfer, moving that offshore uh, or from your current account putting it into investments, 
pinging the money around a couple of uh, some some are legit company, some are simply a shell company. A shell company is simply a company that exists in name only. Really, it, it has no actual physical assets. It's just on paper. It has direct that you you hire, uh, but you just transfer money through it to use the. Um, the veil of uh, incorporation as your way of uh, hiding yourself. And then eventually you take out the money uh, from your two legitimate companies and it appears clean. This is, I say, quite simple um, and things can get more complicated um, very easily. So you can add in a whole host of mechanisms to launder your money. Now, this is going to get deliberately complicated um, because I want to show how difficult it is to, to trace money laundering. I also highlight that at this point that most money laundering schemes don't involve this many different mechanisms in them. But the more mechanisms that you have used, uh, then the, uh, the less likely it is that your money gets spotted and the harder it is for investigators to follow that money. So here you see you can use loans, you can use jewellery. Um, you can buy art. Art's a really good way of laundering money because um, of the values involved. So you can buy a piece of art because the value is so subjective. You can, the actual value of it is difficult to define and you can lie about the amount of money that was um, transferred in that art deal. And then when you sell it on equally, you can um, lie about the amount of money that you sold the art for and how much more of that money was simply uh, laundered funds. Um, litigation is quite an interesting one as well. So it can help if you've got two companies that you have one company sue the other, uh, because then what comes out at the end has, a, has an explanation. Where did I get this money from? Well, it came from this particular court case where I um, uh, sued company X. So money laundering quickly gets more and more complicated. And this is before we even consider the fact that each of these transactions may change the the kind of the the type of money that we're looking at or the asset that we're looking at as well. So it gets more complicated if you start showing it currency transactions. So if I start the money off in pounds, but if I go um, to the south of the slide, the bottom of the slide, I move it into a currency transfer. It's immediately changed. Uh, form. So now it's in dollars and also the authorities are starting to look for a different number because when I move it into dollars, the actual the, the representation of that money is different, which therefore aids me in obscuring uh, my money laundering activities. Likewise, I've also put in Bitcoin there because it adds another uh, change of form um, and means that you can move your assets around um, internationally very easily using cryptocurrencies. And the final thing to sort of take stock of as well is that this isn't all in isolation. So whenever we're dealing with money laundering, the, there's clean money floating around the system as well. Not all of the money involved is dirty, as we might call it. So we get the very crude analogy of clean and dirty money. Uh, but this difference is important because then when we're looking at amounts of money, it might actually be legitimate. And it again makes the, the task of an investigator all the more difficult when we're faced with both uh, legitimate funds and uh, criminal proceeds mixed up in the system. A further thing to consider in relation to money laundering is just the sheer scale of it. Um, and I'm going to say that from the outset, all of these estimations are wrong. Uh, we don't know the extent of money laundering, but when we have tried to guess at it, um, the IMF found in 1998, uh, they guessed between 2 and 5% of global GDP. Uh, that gives quite a big margin for error there. Um, and the Financial Action Task Force went with the definition of between 590 billion and 1.5 trillion. So that's only around $1 trillion uh, margin of error. So they've got it fairly accurately estimated there. Um, and again, you, the UN um, Office of Drugs and Crime, 1.6 trillion in 2009. These estimates, as I say, are not going to be accurate because it's very difficult to uh, estimate how much money laundering takes place, which I'm going to move on to in just a moment. Um, I know I'm based in the UK, so I give a couple of estimations as how we've got global estimations that are difficult to, to uh, be accurate with. That, that problem, it still exists when you look at individual countries as well. So in the UK alone, uh, a whole host of bodies have tried to estimate uh, money laundering um, and come up with very different results. So the FSA, when it existed, between 57 and 23 billion, so quite a big margin there. The NCA that now exists puts it between 36 and 100 billion. Um, so we have these very varied um, estimations, and that can be different, differing estimations from one organization. Um, so yeah, the, the amounts of money laundered 
are uh, difficult to accurately estimate, but we do need to try and estimate it because it gives us the justification for the, the combative measures that are in place. Um, just to touch on some of the reasons why, why it's difficult to estimate money laundering, um, the increasing global nature of financial markets makes it harder and harder to pinpoint where the, the money was laundered. Um, methodologies for uh, calculating money laundering uh, differ um, and therefore produce different results. Uh, there's big issues with double counting, so whether um, how, how many times that individual pound that's been uh, laundered gets counted towards the overall amount of money uh, creates difficulties there. Um, it's a, a shadow uh, shadowy business. Um, it's illicit. It, it's about the sale of um, what well, started off in relation to the anti money laundering started off towards the sale of illegal illegal narcotics. So these aren't businesses that publish accounts. So the audit trail is not particularly clear. Um, and the sheer number of mechanisms uh, for laundering money, or the number of mechanisms that exist for laundering money also makes it harder to estimate um, the amounts being uh, moved around the world because we don't know where to look um, and every new industry um, that we look at we might find more money laundering so typically we find these estimations always rising and the impacts aren't just um, in terms of financial uh, money laundering sometimes gets called this victimless crime because only money moves around uh, but it isn't victimless the issue is that its other impacts are quite difficult to measure uh, they would be uh, yeah, largely intangible. So it reduces the integrity of a financial services industry um, and you lose money in terms of tax. That reducing integrity is quite an important one because that's a, if your country is known for being um, a, a, a common uh, drug trafficking route, then that impacts your economy in that then people won't want to come to your, to your economy or invest in your country. Uh, similarly, if your country is known for being um, a hotspot for uh, illicit financial transactions, then it might put off um, foreign investment as well. So there, there really are um, impacts that are not necessarily tangible, but definitely there. Um, also, the other issue in relation to describing money laundering as victimless and ignoring the impacts are that money laundering existing increases the prevalence of other crimes. Um, so uh, McDowell and uh, Novice found that, that it, it fuels drug dealers, terrorists, illegal arms dealers, because if they're able to make money and use the money from their criminal enterprises, then they're going to um, commit more crimes so as to make more money. Um, so the ability for criminals to actually launder and use their money is what makes crime pay. And that's the sort of the essence of the concept of money laundering. It's making your uh, being able to enjoy and use your assets. So what are the solutions then? So we've got the issue of money laundering, the, the um, moving of your criminal assets through the economy, uh, through the financial system, so as to make it appear clean. Um, and solutions have been developed over um, a number of decades. So we can track UN, UN policy, which started off being um, towards uh, the sale of narcotics. So that was the main concern of the UN early on in relation to uh, money laundering. And it specifically uh, criminalized the, Con the Vienna Convention required signatories to criminalize money laundering the proceeds of drug trafficking. So it's very focused on one offense, uh, but that expanded. So from 2000, it was for serious criminal offenses. Um, and they've now moved towards um, the Corruption Convention as well. So that, that criminalizes the laundering of proceeds of bribery and corruption as well. So the UN has slowly expanded the, the um, amount of activity or the, uh, the uh, breadth of activity that uh, can constitute an offence that therefore money laundering stems from. Similarly, we see with the EU, policies have been expanded over a number of years. So the first uh, money laundering directive from the EU came in 1991. Um, and they've passed four more since. Now, for those of you that may not be familiar with how directives work, directives set a minimum standard that all countries, uh, or all um, EU countries have to then meet um, and apply by. But um, the uh, my London directives are an example of how increasing harmonization has been required because the first money laundering directive and the second to an extent set standards, but the differing ways in which EU members implemented them standards, uh, those standards rendered them uh, sort of ineffective. So more and more so the, the uh, directives have moved to be very um, 
limited in scope for the uh, EU members to uh, change the way in which they implement the directive and they're more and more harmonized uh, to the point where yeah the fifth AMLD is uh, is close to being regulations you might say but it is still a directive and, and but very strict in terms of the leeway that countries have in implementing it. Alongside the EU's uh, policy we see the development of the Financial Action Task Force as well. So these recommendations were first published in 1990 so we can see that they, they tally quite closely with the development of the, of the directives uh, by the EU and looking at their policy you can see a little element of the where one does something, the other does either either the same or uh, a bit or, or goes a bit further. Um, but they created forty recommendations. Um, they've been amended numerous times: so ninety six, two thousand one, two thousand three, and two thousand twelve. Um, there was a brief time where there were forty and then nine extra, uh, but those nine extra have now been incorporated into the one set of forty recommendations. It's important to note that financial action task force policy and recommendations are not legally binding, but they do have a blacklist policy um, and a countries uh, requiring or higher risk jurisdiction policy as well. Um, so they can impose sanctions. They don't tend to go as far as sanctions. They're more likely to impose uh, a blacklisting policy, which requires all of its members to um, strictly uh, monitor all transactions between that jurisdiction and themselves. So they can have um, impacts, even though it is soft law. The approach of the FATF has been to push forward the idea of this risk-based strategy. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I may have to speed up slightly here, but the conscious of the risk-based strategy, um, and that's uh, recommendation one of their um, 40 recommendations. The risk-based strategy basically means putting all of your resources or the, the majority of your resources on the higher risk areas um, to, of your economy and then less resources towards lower risk areas. Um, so it involves prioritizing your resources to where money laundering is most likely to be taking place. Um, so yeah, the risk rate and risk should be constantly assessed. So countries are required to undertake risk assessments uh, regularly so as to detect where their economy is particularly vulnerable in relation to money laundering. So I talked about these preventative measures um, and what we can um, then see with these preventative measures is they take two key forms. We've got customer um, due diligence uh, and we've got suspicious activity reporting. Now, the, um, these are the two uh, key mechanisms they have. Um, I'm going to have a quick look at how they are applied. Um, so customer due diligence is applied to a number of situations, but it's generally, you may know of this to be similar as a know your customer, KYC as well. Uh, KYC could be seen as part of customer due diligence. So knowing your customer is important. And the idea here is to build up an information bank or, or a good level of intelligence as to what your customers are doing, um, that your customer is who they say they are. Um, and therefore you can also work out what a normal transaction is for your customer and be able to work out what is suspicious. So um, a business relationship uh, being established requires CDD to be uh, initiated. Any transactions over £1,000, if it's occasional, needs to be uh, customer due diligence. As I said, that focus is on identifying the customer um, and verifying their identity so we obtain relevant information on them. And the customer due diligence approach or the customer due diligence measures are to be uh, conducted within the risk-based approach. So the amount of information that you acquire from your customer will depend upon the type of service that you're offering. So the higher the money laundering risk attached to the type of business being undertaken, the greater due diligence should be. So this is where we see banks and financial institutions facing the highest levels of customer due diligence um, and why we see that compliance costs for banks are often a lot higher as well. But so customer diligence, to put it in a nutshell, is, is getting that information about the customer um, so that uh, we know what they're doing and why. The second part of um, the preventive approach is what's called suspicious activity reporting. Um, now, just for the UK purposes here, but most countries will have a similar um, offence in place, um, is that it is now offence not to report um, a suspicious activity to your financial intelligence unit um, if you become aware of it. So a person commits an offence they know or suspect or have reasonable grounds to know or suspect that the person is engaged in money laundering based on information that came from 
um, them in the course of business. So we, if you're suspicious or you uh, or even know there's activity in relation to crime, then you have to report that transaction to your FIU. Uh, in, the, in the UK's case, that will be the National Crime Agency. So SARS and CDD are the main two ways in which we try and combat money laundering, detect what's going on in the financial system and report um, anomalies um, when they come across them. Um, but there are problems with that. Um, the first thing I'm going to look at is problems of customer, customer due diligence, which I struggle to say, um, and that it has inherent weaknesses. Um, generally, a money launderer is going to be concerned with uh, making their money appear legitimate. Um, so it follows that obviously launderers will try and adhere to norms and give the answers that they think the customer due diligence operation is looking for, basically. Um, and it based on assumption that customers are going to be honest, whereas if you're laundering money, there's no chance that you're going to be uh, honest in in that situation, you're going to lie so as to get the money through the system. Um, and there's an issue with customer diligence and the focus is on the, um, the uh, institution to collect the information, whereas the uh, individual has no, they're, they're the person with the thing to gain, uh, but they've got no requirement to give truthful information in that situation, uh, which makes cus uh, also customer due, customer due diligence is uh, vulnerable to professional money launderers. Similarly to the reason I just said in relation to giving the correct answers, um, a professional money launderer will know what those correct answers are and be able to clean money for uh, their associates. So um, long prior to the existence of, of customer due diligence, there have been individuals who will clean money for you. Um, so if you can get hold of a corrupt or a corruptible accountant or a corruptible lawyer, a uh, corruptible police officer, then uh, yeah, it eases your uh, money laundering um, process, that's for sure. The second um, part of money laundering or anti-money laundering being suspicious activity reports, well, um, they are unfortunately uh, reliable problems as well. So the main problem we have with, with suspicious activity reports or SARS is the sheer volume that gets uh, submitted, particularly in the UK here. So uh, these figures are for up to 2018. Um, and we can see that the UK gets a high number of uh, suspicious activity reports, which makes it harder to work out what is suspicious activity and what is not. Uh, the UK's uh, Law Commission found three main uh, causes which were interconnected, so a low threshold for reporting, defensive reporting because of the criminal liability for not reporting, and the concept of suspicion, concept of suspicion remaining poorly defined. So to start with uh, on in relation to sorry for flipping through my slides there got a bit too overexcited with the arrow keys uh, suspicious activity reports uh, firstly in relation to suspicion remaining poorly defined the word suspicious is a difficult word to define in dictionary terms and then it makes it even harder to define in relation to legal certainty and knowing when to and not to report so in the uk we had the case of crown and de silver um, in which it seems to be, the, it needs to be something that's more than a possibility, uh, or that's less or more than fanciful that the relevant facts exist, and a vague feeling of unease would not suffice. So I'm sure that is therefore clear when you should and should not report. And so I don't need to go into any more detail about suspicion. Uh, I am obviously being uh, slightly sarcastic there. It does leave us leave us very diff in a very difficult position because criminal liability may be applied to somebody who simply. Uh, didn't submit because they didn't think it was suspicious. Um, so it is an ina inadequately defined term. And this is what causes the rise or it is uh, the link that we believe is it causes the rise in defensive reporting. So defensive reporting is the uh, concept of reporting not because you're actually suspicious, but reporting simply because it means you won't be criminally liable for um, not reporting. Um, it's a lot easier if you're um, the uh, compliance officer in a bank and you've got the choice of reporting something and it being t a tick box exercise or not reporting it and risking uh, a criminal case against you, um, it's fairly clear which you, you may uh, choose to go for. Um, and this raises the issue also of what we're gathering. Are we gathering intelligence or are we gathering simply more and more information? Uh, and it really does uh, heighten that if the more suspicious activity reports that are made, particularly ones that aren't, um, genuine, uh, it just creates that needle in a haystack um, analogy. 
Uh, and my final point in relation to the low threshold as well, so even without the confusion over the definition of suspicion, um, it's a low bar, so it leads to lots of reports anyway, because you may have uh, careful individuals in the financial uh, sector who um, are diligently trying to um, look out for suspicious activity or um, not fulfil the rules, and because of this level, this threshold, it's likely to mean that they will report more often than not. So that low threshold combined with the confusion over the definition and the uh, the ease or the easier option of defensive reporting uh, does lead to a lot of reports, particularly in the UK. But this is a problem that is not solely um, affecting the UK. Lots of um, internet, lots of uh, financial intelligence units suffer from a high level of reporting. So my final slide is the solutions to the problems with the solutions. Um, and I'd leave that to, the, to you in the audience to maybe ask some questions or think about what, uh, what you believe could be a solution to some of the issues that um, I've discussed. I'm going to stop sharing now. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hillman, for that very, very insightful view of what money laundering across the world looks like, and in particular, um, how it's structured in the UK and how AML policies are structured. Uh, Apologies as if I mentioned overran. before, we're now going to be moving into our... Not at all, not at all, sir. I mean, I think the more we know, the better it is, because we're about to move into the moderated sessions, and obviously that means that we get to uh, learn a lot more as we get into these discussions. So before I jump on to some of the questions that obviously is now kind of creeping around all of our heads, uh, uh, let me introduce to you one of our panelists on here. We've got Angelique uh, Juliette from Seychelles. Angelique is actually one of our own. She's one of the global advisors here at Mazel Tov and is based in the Seychelles. Uh, she's an accredited mediator and is actually setting up her own uh, mediation firm in the Seychelles, which is the country's first. Uh, but more to that, she's recently been appointed as the legal compliance officer for the U.S. Youth Council in the Seychelles, uh, and is also, um, and we take great pride in this, working as our director for PR with Mazel Tov. Um, Angelique has done a little bit of work within the financial sector, and she's um, come up with a number of uh, different ways in which to look at anti-money laundering policies uh, within the Pan-African region and Seychelles in general. So as we move on to these discussions, we'll obviously be asking questions to both of you. But uh, let's start off first with Dr. Hillman. And this is something that's um, obviously uh, something that we'd like to know because it features quite heavily in your uh, thesis. With the emergence of digital currencies, how do you think that the uh, world of money laundering is changing? And does this make it a lot easier? Does this make it harder to get away with um, criminal transactions now? So <laughs> cryptocurrencies, digital currencies, cryptocurrencies in particular um, do represent, if we just think about it in terms of what appeals to a money launderer, uh, if you're thinking about how you might clean your money, you'll be looking for something that is relatively safe from your perspective in that you don't want to lose your money, both in that the value doesn't um, plummet or you don't lose your money, they don't give your money back. Um, you want something that is relatively quick because you don't want to sit there for, for years before you get your money back, but you don't want it so quick that it's easy to, to trace. Um, and if possible, high levels of anonymity are great. So if you can not be known by your real name or have a number of aliases, then uh, that will be brilliant as well. All of those things are things that you can, well, apart from maybe the, uh, the value, I'll come to that in a second, but all those things are um, appealing in relation to cryptocurrencies because the speed of transactions is quite quick. There's a high level of anonymity uh, because you're not known by your name. You end up working using public keys instead. So you're just known by an address. Um, which you can change frequently. Um, and um, it's difficult for anybody. Well, there's a double-edged sword that it can be difficult to trace those transactions, but it also the other argument from a cryptocurrency proponent might be actually they're easier to trace because the blockchain provides us with a history of all of those transactions. So it's kind of a, and then just the final thing about value earlier, I'd say like two or three years ago, you might not have used cryptocurrency because the values were so fluctuating and volatile. You might now be more inclined to use a Bitcoin or Ethereum 
because the values are a little bit more uh they're a little bit more concrete that the volatility is slightly less so um so yeah they might use those systems based on all of those characteristics of cryptocurrency and the wants and needs of a money launderer it appears to be too good to be true um, and we're finding some cases of uh, money laundering through cryptocurrencies uh, as we go uh, a few more prevalently in the us so the department of justice is a uh, sort of more regularly prosecuting in relation to cryptocurrencies and money laundering we see a few bits of it in the uk as well in relation to seizure of cryptocurrency um, so there are examples of it happening and you could look at it and thinking it's just too good not to be using it to launder money sure. um, and what about uh, you Angelique? what are your thoughts on potentially the use of cryptocurrency in the world of, in the emerging world of uh, money laundering because uh, as we understand, there's a lot of instances of phishing scams and frauds that um, happen in the Pan-African region. And to be fair, it happens in a lot of Asian uh, regions as well. And I understand there's literally a pandemic of phishing scams going around in the UK amongst the student community, because I still get those emails on my student account. Uh, so how do you think um, you know, that world is uh, emerging or that world is playing out? Um, in your experience? Yeah, I think um, with cryptocurrency, being from a small island like Seychelles, it has, it has its experiences boom where everyone is interested in cryptocurrency. And the good thing about it here is that our legislation that can't combat any money laundering in Seychelles does make provisions for cryptocurrency. So that means that we are well aware that digital, the digital era that is taking over has opened up this this new this new division that criminals can exploit and so then you have banks in Seychelles that are trying to make sure that their CC their CDDs and their SARS are up to date but we're always going to be vulnerable because in Africa especially we're very much cash based so most of our um, resources we deal with cash so yes we have this cryptocurrency emerging but we have to remember that Africa is still very reliant on this cash-based economy. And so, yes, we have cryptocurrency, but Africa's main issue now is that people are coming into Africa, buying resources with illegal money and just making it clean through the system that we already have. So multinationals and various offshore companies come and set up in Seychelles, for example, and they just clean their money through the ways that they have. So purchasing land, for example, or purchasing goods, gold, as Dr. Hillman's slide mentioned, is quite common. And so I think with cryptocurrency, it's a fairly new concept, but it is a concept that will definitely become a big deal soon. Yeah. yeah um, I think Just to pick up, sorry, on what Angelique was saying, that's an important thing in relation to that comparison between cryptocurrency and cash. Cash, if you're in a cash um, intensive or, or like a high level of cash use in your economy, cash, cash is much better than um using cryptocurrencies because you've already got that lack of paper trail because i mean you're not going to keep your receipts <laughs> if you're if you're laundering your money are you or you're if you do keep the receipts they'll be uh, doctored so yeah you can cash makes a massive sense and also highlighting what angie was saying in relation to differing economies provide different opportunities for money laundering so you would you will do with you will do what works best for you in your economy it, there'd be no point um trying to run a cash intensive money laundering operation in a country that doesn't use very much cash so if you're i think japan might be very low cash and, and lots of parts of london are on, and different cities in the uk are very low cash circulation more via contactless payments and, and card payments so yeah you adapt to your environment on that front and so for lots of countries particularly cryptocurrencies might not that be that big a risk at the moment because there are far better or uh, far more established traditional money laundering mechanisms. I mean, I think we see this across a number of different jurisdictions as well that are still heavily reliant on cash. Um, a lot of the criminal activity uh, that, as you mentioned earlier in your uh, presentation, Dr. Hillman, it starts off with that criminal transaction and then you try and clean the money. And I think uh, when that initial transaction in itself is relatively untraceable because it's from a cash-based system, um, it obviously becomes a lot easier. In comparison, we've got cryptocurrencies and um, how they function. And with the introduction of blockchains, obviously, it's a lot more traceable. And therefore, 
you're looking at a new set of rules potentially, because I would like, and this is a question that's both come from the audience and it's something that we wanted to bring up in the moderated session. We've got the uh, fifth AML directive that came out a couple of, uh, I think about a couple of years ago. Um, and it does to a larger degree, go on to discuss uh, more effective control on money laundering structures and financial criminal structures. But it also does touch upon the point of the emerging world of digital currencies. Um, in effect, how do you think the fifth directive has now changed the scape uh, of financial cr criminal activity uh, within Europe? I don't know if it's made that much difference yet, if I'm honest, because I mean, I'm, I'm more um, first in the in the cryptocurrency side of things and the application of the fifth amld anti-money directive to cryptocurrencies is yes they brought them under the or within the regulatory perimeter uh, is a phrase that's often used so cryptocurrencies are now in the regulatory perimeter within europe which means that um uh, transactions between cryptocurrencies and fiat currencies are now subject to suspicious activity reporting but I, and I was careful in the way I said that because that, that, that therefore means that some cryptocurrency transactions are inside the regulatory perimeter, but lots of them still remain outside of that regulatory perimeter and outside of customer due diligence and therefore limits the potential use or impact of applying uh, money laundering um, mechanisms or anti-money laundering mechanisms to cryptocurrencies. So all the, the fifth AMLD applies to are the intersections between cryptocurrencies and FIAT currencies. The UK has gone one step further. Um, I think it went one step further than the, U, than the EU in that it has also applied it to transactions between cryptocurrencies as well. So if you're transferring your Bitcoin for your uh, Litecoin or Ethereum, then those transactions may be subject to a report in the UK. The actual um, implementation of that of the UK is an entirely different issue. I don't know how well the FCA has implemented that yet. Um, but yeah, that's the difference there. So at the moment, the application of AML to cryptocurrencies is only still to the fringes of the network, uh, which means that if I were to undertake transactions in Bitcoin, um, uh, the only times that the authorities may see it is it going into um, the network and it's coming out of the network. It won't have seen what happens all of the other times uh, with it. And even then, it'll only have seen it go into the network if it went in uh, through uh, a exchange or through a regulated um, wallet provider or simply in a, in a regulated jurisdiction. Um, and so if I use an unregulated uh, provider, then um, the, val the, the, the use of that information to, to the authorities is is much less because they're only seeing a snapshot of me taking the money out, by which point I will have made it look as legitimate as possible. Um, I'd probably have a cryptocurrency startup in my name at some point or make it look like I, I'm an early investor in cryptocurrencies. And that's the reason I have that large amount of money, nothing to do with anything in relation to my other, other businesses. So that's probably one of the ways we can get away with money laundering, isn't it? Um... <laughs> Yes, I mean, I think I said to you previously, um, money, I probably said it during um, any lectures that I gave you on money laundering. Money laundering is very difficult to trace. And as a result of it, it is, it is very likely that you can get away with money laundering. Uh, and I'm also conscious, and I, I don't want to tell and your, your audience to go and launder money, but I just say it, it is something that given the um, detecting mechanisms that we have it is possible to commit money laundering and not get caught and often we're reliant upon mistakes by um criminals in order to sort of get that that chink so the way in then means that you might be detected so if you've got your money laundering activities if you're if one thing falls foul and someone starts investigating it then it might all fall apart quite easily depending upon how complicated the system you have um but yeah we're we're, we're often i say we Investigators and um, uh, and the authorities are very much dependent, usually on on errors by the criminals in what they've used, um, and a suspicious activity report or customer diligence being being completed. Um, to that effect, uh, while I understand that the EU has gone ahead and um, given us directives in terms of how to combat money laundering problems. From what I understand, neither Asia or Pan-Africa has something that's quite similar. 
we don't necessarily have a regional uh, structure, do we, Angelique? No, I think, um, like you mentioned, um, Africa, for example, doesn't really have a, a streamlined or universally accepted definition of money laundering. And so every state has its own way of responding to money laundering acts, financial crimes as well. And so I think it makes it very difficult for us then to be able to establish what exactly are the offenses that fall under money laundering. Because like Dr. Hillman said, it's a criminal act that leads to somebody getting caught with under the money laundering umbrella. And so I think um, the FATF, which Dr. Hillman mentioned in his slides, does provide regulations, but again, they're not binding. And so it is up, it falls upon the state basically to make up their own regulations that encompass every aspect of financial crime, which I think is very difficult because now we're going into cryptocurrency, we're going into Bitcoins and all these like digital, um, digital intensive frameworks. And so with Africa, there has been this issue of this inadequate understanding of digital literacy. And so if we don't understand how cryptocurrency works, then how are we to legislate it or regulate it? And so it's an ever-changing system. And especially now with COVID, um, financial crime has literally boomed into this whole taking advantage of the digital um, scene that there is. And so it's it's quite sad that we don't have this framework like the EU do, does. And I think it'd be really good if we did. Um, to start implementing it might be a problem because again, Africa is uh, uh, has this problem of digital literacy and how do we start, how do we begin to understand this and how do we work towards something that will be this legislation that we can all use, even Asia for that matter. Um, absolutely, and I think one of the things that's very interesting is obviously um, on two fronts. Asia, uh, you mentioned the FATF earlier, and this is something that I think is particularly interesting. Uh, because the FATF obviously identifies a set of risks or nations that um, have risks attached to them as you uh, work with them. This is a question for the both of you, because I, I know I feel a little bit strongly about this and my colleague Ruff Ruff does as well. Uh, with the FATF painting certain nations like Pakistan and Bangladesh and a series of others in a certain light, uh, there is that problem where we then find it difficult to expand into a larger economy, larger market. And what that means is in a lot of ways, there's a evidence of, not evidence, but there is that possibility of discrimination and profiling based on how we function and how our financial structures are uh, functioning. Uh, to both of you then, the question lies is, do you think that the FATF needs to take on a new form? Or should there be an alternative means of regulating money laundering or um, financial crimes in general that could potentially do without that degree of profiling? In fact, is there a possibility that we can look at uh, money laundering in a way without, you know, without profiling to some degree? So I'll, I'll leave it with Dr. Hillman first and then we'll move on to Angelique. I was going to actually invite Angelique first because um, you're, in a, you're in a jurisdiction where you may be much more you've got you've got a better understanding of how it might impact a country if they have faced that level of like maybe yeah prejudicial treatment or profiling um so i think yeah as a as a in a different position and i can talk on it in how, how i can i think a bit if i come after you so angelique if you go first um, all right, so I feel like I do understand um, where you're coming from. Thank thankfully, Seychelles hasn't been profiled negatively. And I think just coming from my perspective, obviously, Seychelles is very heavy reliant on tourism and our image across the world is very important. And so if tomorrow we do face this profiling, I think it will have this extremely detrimental effect. And I think when we think when we talk about profiling, in, in a certain way, in a very old fashioned way, I suppose, by profiling this country as having such bad, um, you know, issues with money laundering, it does kind of make that country realize like, well, I need to stop, I need to have, I need to sort out my issues. But in on the flip side, if you profile this country, and like you said, you don't get this foreign direct investment like Seychelles and a lot of Pan-African countries need, then you're basically putting it, us up to not having this foreign direct investment. And so I think the FATF really need to address the way that they 
see countries who are falling below the regulations or guidelines in a different light. Let's not publicly profile them. Let's give them warnings to say, let's say, okay, I will give you six months. Within that six months, if you haven't, you know, made any improvements, then fine. Let's publicly tell these these people that you're you're not adhering to these regulations. But I think approaching it very carefully is very important because we are all countries trying to struggle in this world where we have to compete and we need foreign direct investments. And so we can't let let money laundering issues in my own country reflect poorly on what the country can do and what it can offer. So I think, like you say, I think the FATF really need to sit down, analyze how exactly they're going to approach countries who do fall under, you know, poor money laundering regulations and maybe address them individually first. And then if they persist, then go ahead and publicly tell the world that they're doing, sorry, like a really bad job. But I do feel that, and I might be wrong, I feel like the, the profiling is, is a poor choice, honestly. Dr. Gilman. So, and, and that's my sort of perspective or my sort of take on that is, is to look at where the FATF came from. So it initiated from the G7 in 1989, the Paris um, meeting of the summit. And when you look at those nations, they're very you do get that analogy of West against the rest kind of thing. Um, I don't know what the, the best word, like, or the globe, but there's, there's a phrase of the global North and global South, but it generally seems to come from a position of, we're going to tell you what to do. And, and, I, and I don't think that's necessarily like the outlying intention of telling countries what to do, but we do end up with this situation where the FATF sets these 40 recommendations, um, which are developed by countries that have the means to develop these recommendations. And they're broadly formed also in the kind of, from the perspective of those nations. So with the way in which the mod, uh, mutual evaluation reports work, you see the higher scores are the US, the UK, de developed for wanting a better word, uh, definitely wanting a better word, um, nation. So you get that kind of disparity in the, where the countries that are developing the rules have the money and the infrastructure to put in place the rules they then look at countries that maybe are facing differing problems but still trying to apply the FATF recommendations that doesn't necessarily seem fair to me in that sense so it does need to be a bit more of a um uh, then the other issue you sort of may face is that I don't I don't want to suggest that we have a double standard or double standards or two tiered system in terms of we expect X countries to meet this tier and X country and Y countries to meet this tier as well. So I'm afraid I'm not really answering the question, but more recognizing the problem in the sense that the FATF comes from um, the sort of developed uh, developed world. I keep using that phrase, I'm not liking it, um, and. Um, from that perspective, they're then imposing those rules on countries that don't have that infrastructure when an approach, I suppose, for Africa in general might be one that is an FATF of Africa. I believe there are, I mean, there's definitely the Asia Pacific group of the FATF. Um, I'm not familiar with, uh, with the, there's, I'm guessing there's a um, regional group yeah, we, within yeah. Africa as well. Mm -hmm. So there are these regional groups that, that maybe need to become more prominent in terms of setting precedent for or setting rules for their jurisdiction um, and breaking maybe breaking a bit free from the FATF in that sense um, but yeah that would be my kind of take on it is mainly this that disparity of West v the rest and the issues that come from it. I think if I might if I might interject here one of the things that um, is unique about Asia or at least the Asian region is that we don't necessarily have a regional court so if you have the um, EU directives or if you have the FATF that kind of broadly covers say either Africa or uh, broadly covers uh, Europe you've got then the European courts or the um, pan-African courts that you can take up a lot of these issues too when it's a uh, problem with different sorts of jurisdictions because usually with money laundering you're kind of encompassing multiple jurisdictions uh, because we don't have a similar thing here in Asia that becomes a bit of a problem whereas you don't know where and how to prosecute We'll move on to that a little bit uh, later, but in light of what we've just discussed in terms of that possibility of profiling, that possibility of discrimination, I imagine that there comes with that a 
that same sort of problems when you're looking into suspicion at an individual level, when you're looking into individual customers coming in and when you're um, performing customer due diligence, um, banks are, or individuals in charge of financial institutions are often left with this position of trying to figure out, oh, this guy might be, you know, uh, we might have to keep an eye out for this guy versus X, Y, Z. And to that effect, we've got with us two very senior um, colleagues. Uh, we've got uh, Mr. Lakshmi Prapanna Narula, who's the chairman at the ADB Agricultural Development Bank and the former executive director at Nepal Rashtra Bank. And along with him, we've got Mr. B. N. Karthi, a PhD scholar who's now been in the in banking industry of Nepal for about 25 years. Uh, provides consultancies to banks and financial institutions in Nepal and Bhutan and uh, facilitates trainings to the broad board of directors, um, senior management and other staff to various different banks across Nepal and Bhutan. Sir, it's uh, lovely to have you here. Thank you so much for your time. If you. you might direct a question to you, uh, because obviously this, uh, we can only benefit from the vast amount of experience that you've had with these banking structures. In both of your experiences, um, when dealing with money laundering or when dealing with financial crime at a larger scale, to what degree do you uh, encounter these levels of um, operational risk in terms of financial crime? Uh, and how do you have to take that into um, account when designing operational risk management? So I'll, I'll uh, start with Mr. Narula, and then I'll move on to Mr. Karthi, if that's OK. Okay, thank you. And present in present scenario in Nepal, uh, high level supervisory attention in AMLCFT is happening now. And uh, another uh, thing, uh, uh, regulators have uh, dramatically step up enforcement of AMLCFT laws and regulation now in Nepal. And um, uh, Nepal has developed uh, legal and uh, regulatory framework and institutional framework based on the FATF's recommendation number two. And um, uh, uh, in Nepal, uh, in this uh, area, we have all, all the um, reporting um, entity is working very well now. Uh, <coughs> Uh, in Nepal, in, uh, I feel uh, it is better uh, now. And uh, an additional matter regarding this subject will be explained by my colleagues, uh, B.N. Karthi. Okay, then let's move on to Mr. Karthi. Your views, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, greetings from Nepal. <clears throat> Uh, before discussing on uh, uh, whether the operational risk management framework contributes uh, in mitigating the uh, financial crime and money laundering, I would like to discuss whether it has the positive relationship among operational risks, financial crime, and money laundering. As we know, money laundering is showing the illegally owned or received money as if it was owned or received through the leg legitimate source or legal activity. Then a uh, Basel Committee on Banking Supervision uh, has mentioned that it has categorized the operational risks in seven categories out of it, number one and number two, are related with the internal fraud and external fraud. Internal fraud and external fraud are financial crime. And once the uh, fund is generated or received through this uh, financial crime, these are again used for the money laundering. Therefore, it has the positive relationship among these three uh, typologies, financial crime, operational risks, and money laundering. As if we have the operational risk management uh, framework uh, with to mitigate the automatically contribute in mitigating the financial crime and money laundering. 
operational risk arises due to four reasons, especially four uh, reasons, four factors which contribute to happen the operational risk. A, people, B, process, C, external events, and D, system. These are the four factors which contribute uh, in getting caused the operational risk. Then, if uh, while talking about this, uh, uh, two factors are more important to curb the money laundering activities. One, identifying the people. Identifying the people means identifying the customers, identifying the our employees, identifying the third parties, which are uh, which means uh, the suppliers. If we have the system and programs which contributes to identify the, uh, them properly, to monitor their activities properly. And if we detect any uh, suspicious transactions and activity, and if we have the mechanism to report, then it will uh, automatically contribute to mitigate the uh, money laundering activities. Similarly, operational risks also cause due to having our poor infrastructure. That means if we have uh, in educate or failed internal processes. If we have failed internal process, that would also contribute uh, not having our customers identifying properly, not categorizing the risks properly, not monitoring them properly, not filing the TTR and STS properly. Therefore, if we have the good infrastructure in terms of risk management or AML safety compliance, then it shall automatically contribute to mitigate financial crime as well as money laundering activities. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your uh, insight. And I note at the same time that um, obviously Henry's got a lot of experience in the, uh, in banking as well, and he's taught banking modules with uh, UE. Henry, what's your take on uh, potentially creating a structure of operational risk management that could account for money laundering? Um, I'd like to firstly play down my experience in banking. I lecture on banking and regulation, but I've never uh, worked in a bank. So I would be bowing to uh, others, uh, yeah, more learned uh, positions on this. I think in terms of it, it comes back to that risk based approach. Um, so that's what's required for most institutions. So as part of understanding how you can stop money laundering within your institution or your business, it generally comes down to undertaking a risk analysis or a risk assessment and to try and therefore focus your resources on that. Um, and as has been mentioned, uh, in relation to training, again, it just comes down to your employees knowing what they're looking for. Um, so when I started today's presentation I didn't know what the level of understanding of money laundering would be amongst the the audience and, and, it, and that's an issue that we face in relation to financial crime and money laundering across the board so whenever you're facing an, like training a new employee they may have may be unaware of the practices of money laundering um, and then even someone who's who's aware of money laundering might need to kind of keep up their education so they're aware of uh, new emerging trends in laundering money and where the new threats are. So I think, and not to sort of just come back to the FATS recommendations, but that risk-based approach is the only one we've kind of got, particularly from a business perspective, because otherwise you'd be spending all of your money, all of your money on uh, anti-money laundering, um, trying to apply the same level of, 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 of like strict compliance to every single transaction. And it would slow things down. It would hinder your business massively. So I think the key thing in terms of undertaking a structure within your business comes down to the, the comments already been made in relation to education of your, of your staff and awareness of the issue and applying that risk-based um, approach as well in terms of uh, transactions. I want to pick up slightly on something you said earlier as well in relation to um, how we treat international um, questions, uh, sorry, how we treat international transactions coming back to a previous question. Um, but I suppose a good analogy to think about that is just if you think about your neighboring country or a country further afield, think about how you, in terms of like profiling prejudice, think about how you respond to a transaction from there. Um, so if you're in Pakistan and you're facing a transaction from India, uh, yeah, I went there quick, <laughs> then you're going to be more suspicious of that transaction than if it's um, 
coming from within Pakistan or just down the road. So there's that element to sort of face in relation to we always treat things that are different. We're more likely to treat as as suspicious. Um, and that's the same, I suppose, for undertaking a, a risk analysis in your industry, in your in your institution, being aware of uh, what you normally face, what's money, what looks like money laundering, what doesn't look like money laundering and being uh, yeah, flexible to or adaptive to different practices um, and being able to assess them for suspicion too. Yeah. Um, and then again, coming down to, I think, how, when we talk about money laundering and financial crime and all of this, uh, one of the things that I remember, and I remember literally writing this in one of my essays for uh, Professor Ryder, uh, probably right after one of your classes uh, back in 2016, VK Raja, the former um, attorney general in Singapore, he made this very prominent point where he talks about how the lack of a definition in a lot of the things in, pertaining to money laundering um, leads to that inability to effectively prosecute. You're trying to cast a very wide net and hoping that we'll catch as many fish as possible. But with that wide net, we've got a lot of um, empty spaces through which the fish run away. Um, in light of that, when we talked about customer due diligence, when we talk about um, suspicious activity, how do you think it's best to draw the lines uh, of where the reporting requirements should lie, um, who to then um, hold liable for the reporting requirements? And I ask this question to everyone across the board because I recognize um, we've got a number of people who can actually comment on this. So we'll start off with uh, Mr. Carthy. Uh, and then we'll move on to uh, Henry and then Angelique. Well, it's, uh, first of all, let's discuss on the risk-based approach. Risk-based approach means, first of all, we have to understand that where are the risks, whether with the, with the viewpoint of the geographical locations, with the viewpoint of the high-risk customers, or with the viewpoint of the uh, large volume of transactions, or with the, uh, regarding to the wire transfer or the trade financing or delivery and uh, our uh, products line. Based on, based on this, where lies the risk? Based on this, risk management framework should be developed and implemented. While talking about the uh, customer due diligence, customer due diligence is not one-time job. Is a continuous process, monitoring the transactions, monitoring the customer's activities, and if any suspicious activity or transactions are found, then immediately to take the corrective action for mitigating those risks. So if we carry out uh, cus uh, customer due diligence activities uh, pervasively or comprehensively, and uh, as uh, Dr. Hillman mentioned that if we develop the capacity of our staff to detect it, to identify the customers properly, then it will automatically, it will automatically contribute to mitigate those rates also, money laundering or trade, uh, any other such type of criminal activities to mitigate and side by side comply with the FATF recommendations or the country laws. Thank you. Right. So Dr. Hillman, um, where do we draw the line in the sand? I mean, the definitions are difficult. And as I alluded to in the presentation, definitions of suspicion have been problematic. Um, a small point in relation to most money laundering offences, lots of them don't even use the word money. Um, so the UK one in particular, you won't find the word money in the definitions. It will be uh, moving of criminal assets or proceeds. So we've got, a, again, that very wide net. Anything can be used to, to launder money as well. Suspicion is one of those terms that's very difficult to define from a legal perspective because it's got such a subjective nature to it. Um, I suppose the bigger issue we have is that we've then attached criminal liability to this suspicion as well. So um, I don't know whether it would be better in the future to have maybe a tiered level. So there, there is an element of an objective test as well to mm -hmm. suspicion. Um, so there's the reasonable man test essentially in the UK. So what a reasonable person um, would find suspicious if you don't, find, then you should report it as well. So there's that element to it as, uh, as a result. But I think 
it's going to be that constant balance, isn't it? I don't think that money laundering regulation can ever kind of stay still enough to have um, definite uh, sort of definitions of suspicion or definite uh, typologies of this is money laundering and that is not because it's kind of a constant game of, of cat and mouse with the uh the money launderers in that they're going to if you if you make your system watertight for uh for uh international transfers out of your institution then they're just going to move their um activities to either domestic transfers or a different currency or go somewhere else or maybe look for a different vulnerability okay we can't do it via international bank transfers let's do it via property purchases let's do it via uh insurance is in because you've got a moving target i think you then struggle to have that concrete definition uh, because intent of setting parameters for the regulators to follow given the prevalence maybe of internet of professional money launderers and how complicated money laundering systems can be you're also then giving definitions to the the money launderers as well aren't you and then therefore they know what to avoid so we see that in case in relation to the us the uh, currency transaction report threshold is set at, at $10,000. So therefore, as a result of that, we see the practice of criminals putting their uh, money into US accounts underneath that $10,000 mark. So you might have some that are around the 9,000 mark, high eights, mid nines, but constantly avoiding that 10,000 threshold uh, because that's been given as a threshold to therefore avoid if you are a criminal, because you can see, well, that's not suspicious. So I'll just go underneath it. So. Yeah, I think there's there's room to improve the definition of sus definition of suspicion and maybe helping uh, in relation to red flags, but I don't think we can give a definitive um, yeah a definitive definition. That's a horrible phrase. Um, a clear definition of suspicion because it's constantly changing um, and the very nature of the word suspicious is difficult to 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 kind of define in in law. Angelique, your take on yeah, this? Yeah, I completely um, agree with Dr. Hillman. And I think with um, the aspect of reporting um, in terms of Africa, I think it's really important that we start reporting these crimes. And I think one of the biggest issues in Africa is that there isn't enough reporting on financial crimes that are happening currently. And so we don't have this basis of what actually is going on in Africa. Um, I think what we as individual states need to do as well is build on this own reporting system within our own countries which then at some point we can all meet and say, okay, we'll look in this area, maybe Eastern and Southern part of Africa, we're experiencing more of this type of money laundering, or maybe in West Africa, there's this different type of, of money laundering. And I think the issue is with this, like Dr. Hillman highlighted again, it's, it's, it's such a wide crime basically. And so if we're talking about a net, the net is just gonna get bigger and then the holes are gonna get even bigger. And so we will never be able to capture every single development that will happen. And with COVID right now, everyone's online and banks are telling you, okay, well do online transactions. Let's get the, everything is so heavily reliant on online transactions that these professional financial money laundering criminals are sitting there like, oh, well, this is my opportunity. This is my time to shine. And so how do you as a bank, obviously, ensure that your customers are practicing very safe banking for that matter or not even just in banking any sort of in, um, business or profession that are now online and are accepting payments have to remember that with customer due diligence is quite important even in other types of businesses not only in banking because you've literally taken us from in-person interaction with your bank with your um, manager for that matter or purchasing something in, a, in bulk for that matter. And so it's important to remember that, yes, we're talking about financial crime in banking systems, but it can happen in any sort of industry really. And so then how do we then address money laundering on such a wide scale? Yes, banking is, is very important, but do we encompass every single aspect of it? I don't think that's that's possible. It might be in future when we have better understanding and it goes back to reporting. But I think it will be very difficult right now with COVID and everything going on. So yeah. Uh, yeah, um, to that, actually, that's a perfect segue into one of the more popular questions that we got coming out of the audience uh, for the uh, the session is in this new world of COVID uh, and in the post-pandemic era, how are we looking at 
uh, money laundering and what are the possible um, changes in how criminals are, uh, might, you know, criminals might function going forward. Because obviously this landscape has somewhat changed. Uh, I personally can attest to the fact that Bangladesh has shifted from, not largely, but to some extent, it's gone from a cash-based economy to using a online wallet portal. So it's basically an app on your phone where you deposit money with the local agency and you use your phone then to obviously transact between uh, different peoples. And it's got a numerous different features. This comes with the, with the myriad of problems attached to money laundering historically. So it, in, imaginably, this is one of those things that we can see happening more and more going forward. So in light of that new era, you know, in light of the pan, post-pandemic era, what are your thoughts, uh, Dr. Hillman? as we're looking at the world of money laundering and financial crime. It's opened up um, a sweet shop as far as uh, financial crime is concerned, because, and then that's not just money laundering, but other wider financial crime issues. So uh, fraud in particular um, will be extremely prevalent in um, the near future. We saw it during the, the sort of the first lockdowns, as lockdowns start to happen, pretty much as soon as the furlough scheme in the UK was introduced, there was, there will be fraudulent applications for furlough money. You find people who are no longer been employed for years still being registered as a furloughed member or staff so that a company can claim the 80% of their wage from the government. So it's, um, yeah, there's that factor to it. Pretty much as soon as, um, as, soon as we uh, instigated the uh, vaccine in the UK, you start seeing and instigate the vaccine. So we start roll out the vaccine in the UK. Um, you start to see uh, fake vaccine calls, fake vaccine emails. So, and I'm sure that's true in all of the countries that you're in. You'll get people who have been scammed out of um, out of thousands and thousands of of pounds or dollars or um, their currency because they've uh, signed up to a, ref a vaccine scheme or a door-to-door -door vaccinator. Uh, there's those been those things as well. And then, and then there's the other side of what are they injecting into people or what pills are being given out. But yeah, a whole host of issues. And the more the, the more we're online, the more susceptible we are to uh, financial crime because of a, of a cyber um, cyber flavor, if you use a, a sort of that word. But because you're not seeing that person face to face, you've lost that trust. Um, so as, as Angelique said, in relation to switching from face to face working to online working through a computer, it's so much easier to lie about who you are. Um, so yeah, the, it'll be a case of um, monitoring, trying to educate the public in relation to safe usage of um, IT, uh, but then that will depend upon how generally computer literate your population is as well. So in the UK, it's massively, there's massive disparities about who is and is not uh, in levels of financial, lit financial literacy and for computer literacy. So that combined means that we're going to be susceptible to financial crime, which I would guess is going to be something that, yeah, it, all jurisdictions will face um, in the in the coming years. Angelique, um, I will re resonate with you in saying that it's COVID has definitely opened up a Pandora's box of new that versions is. of phishing scams and frauds and financial crimes, uh, which then leads to money laundering. Um, what's it looking like in Africa? What's uh, how how are things in the Seychelles and Pan African region? Well, I think um, obviously, like Dr. Hillman mentioned, with the whole vaccine, so all everyone wants to get their population vaccinated. So then it's very easy for you to fall into this trap of someone saying, oh, look, I will provide you with this amount of vaccine at this amount of time. And you can imagine you're, you're going to be like, yes, I want I, I need this for my, my country. And there you go, pays for a vaccine and it never happens. <laughs> Luckily, in Seychelles, we've been we've been given our vaccine, so we don't have, really have this issue of people coming to scam us saying, saying, oh, well, I have this vaccine, let me sell it to you. So thankfully we don't have that, but I'm sure in Africa, um, not only just vaccines, there are people who pose as government officials saying, oh, look, we have this grant, we want to, to help you in this way or that way. And there is a ton of case laws and not even just case laws. If you type case laws in Africa about money laundering, you will see governors taking money from um, state accounts and turning it in bankrupts and using it for their own personal use. So it's 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 scary as yes, to think that now we turn into this this community where we're thinking, oh, let me use vaccines to get some some money into my pocket. 
it's quite sad, but it's happening. And I think we really need to respond to it. And so how do we respond to something like that is very hard because we do have the WHO who kind of, you know, is the body that is telling us if the vaccine is a good one, if it's accepted and all that. But you will always have these ingenious people who sit at home and think, okay, how can I steal some money? And I know everyone is asking and wondering, how can I get away with it? And I think Dr. Hillman answered that question. And I remember getting asked on our Instagram page about how to get away with it. And during my time of reading up on financial crime, there is this guy who tried to sell the Eiffel Tower back in 1925. And interestingly, he came up with 10 commandments for a con man. And so if anyone is interested in knowing how to get away with it, then do look it up and see what he says. Yeah, follow our Instagram. Look, check out Angelique's uh, um, description of what you need to do in order to sell <laughs> what is potentially a national monument to a random person. But um, to you, Mr. Garthi and Mr. Narula, both of you guys have been captains of industry and in banking in Nepal. Um, what does the new era in the post-pandemic world look like with regards to financial crime in Nepal and um, across Asia? What are your opinions, sirs? So I'll start with Mr. Uh, Narula, and then we'll move on to Mr. Karthi. Uh, uh, thank you. But in this, uh, in this uh, context, uh, in Nepal, we are not facing um, a lot of financial crime as well as the money laundering. Uh, but um, in Nepal, uh, regarding the trade-based money laundering, uh, how can we prudently monitoring uh, trade-based money laundering? It is very challenging us. But other, um, other scenario, other sectors, uh, uh, we, we cannot facing uh, a lot of, uh, you know, very uh, serious uh, money laundering act um, in Nepal scenario. Uh, in my, in, this is my observation. I think uh, uh, more uh, explain uh, in this uh, area, Mr. Uh, Garthi, my colleagues, Mr. Garthi. So, Mr. Garthi, your opinion: What, what does the world of uh, financial crime and money laundering looked like and how's the landscape changing in Nepal and uh, across Asia in terms of banking? Yeah, after this uh, pandemic COVID-19, uh, our country went uh, about ready for six months lockdown last year. This time also uh, currently we are under the uh, partially lockdown out of the 77 districts, uh, 72 districts are under lockdown currently. And as Basel Committee on Banking Supervision has also mentioned that the landscape of uh, these operational risks as well as money laundering has changed. And it has turned uh, to us the cyber threats as well as computer hacking and social engineering, as uh, Mr. Uh, Hillman, uh, Dr. Hillman mentioned, these types of activities are taking place. And one good thing is uh, the use of digital banking has increased significantly. This has eased up the banking. We can do remote banking, but side by side, it has increased many risks significantly because we can't if the customer visits at the branches we can monitor his activity or we can monitor transaction even if our uh, software uh, cannot detect the transaction then even the tailor can detect it for example in the case of in the case of stock sharing or smurfing the tailor can also notice it and uh, he or she can report but this does not take place uh, while taking place the digital banking because uh, there are a few reasons. A, all the bankers don't have the IT knowledge, thorough IT knowledge. They have to be dependent on the IT professionals and the softwares which we use are third party uh, outsourced or developed or it was uh, developed by the third party. 
these are the reasons why there, there would be the possibilities of increasing the financial crime as well as money laundering activities. Therefore, the bank and financial institutions should be uh, more vigilant and therefore they should have the risk management infrastructure developed in a such way that they can detect such uh, transaction taken place through digital banking. Thank you. Right. Um, I think this is definitely a resounding thing where all of us agree that uh, in the post-pandemic era, we're going to be needing a lot more digital literacy, but also uh, we're going to be requiring some degree of financial literacy as we move forward and uh, work more on uh, dealing with online banking and uh, financial transactions. And on that note, I wanna thank everyone who is here today. Uh, before we end this discussion, obviously there's one little question that seems to be popping up so often amongst our um, followers over at Mazel Tov. It's how do we get away with this sort of a crime? Uh, while we are not able to obviously answer this, um, we will try to put up something on the Mazel Tov Instagram group. But um, if I might ask for closing remarks from our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Hillman, uh, we'll end it with you. I what are your I'll end, I'll end on the how to get away with it. It's generally keeping it simple. Um, I suppose if you make too many mistakes, that's how you're going to get caught. So if you can find a very simple way uh, to launder your money, um, then uh, that's your best bet. But as I said on this a number of times, the um, the the actual sorry, I, I won't stop too long. The actual pro pro processes that you go through are not criminal offences in themselves. They only become a criminal offence if you've committed the crime to start with. Um, so um, yeah, I would say don't uh, stay away from the crime, uh, kids, and stay on the straight and narrow. And then you won't have to uh, worry about uh, how you launder your money or looking suspicious. So I think that's the side of it. But yeah, the, the aim of money laundering is to have a backstory for your money, isn't it? So the simpler and more believable your backstory is, the more likely you will be to get away with it. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hillman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Narula, Mr. Carthy, and Angelique for joining us today. Thank you to all our viewers who've shown us support and hopefully will continue to do so as we move forward. Mazel Tov will strive to bring you more of these series. Uh, the next installment obviously is going to be a panel discussion. Uh, we'll put up ads everywhere. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. We'll help you with all your questions as we move forward. Bye-bye. Um...